It's good evening. Good to see everybody out tonight. I want to uh, bring you a message tonight that I'm going to use a couple verses um, as a pretext and one that the, the sermon is titled after. It's really coming from Luke 15 tonight. A couple verses to set it up. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Uh, the Bible does tell us in Luke's gospel, Jesus said this in Luke 6, verse 38. He said, give and it will be given to you. And I mentioned many times before that could be used in the economic sense. And a lot of times we think of that verse, give and it will be given unto you. And when we think of giving and so forth, we, we think of money and, and that kind of thing, currency uh, and economics. But as you read Luke chapter 6, there's not a mention of any money. So we look at it, step back from a different viewpoint, and we hear what Jesus had to say, give and it will be given unto you. So if you want some help, what, what should you do? I want you to go help somebody else. If you want uh, somebody to help make your day better, why don't you go help somebody make somebody else's day better? Why don't you look for something good you can do for other people? And you give, and it will be given unto you. Now with that, with that idea of starting this thing off, Paul writes in the book of Romans in chapter 12, Verse 15, he said, Rejoice with those who rejoice. And you know, I think maybe at one, this is one place where the church could really use some improvement. I mean, if, 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 if somebody has a death in their family, we're generally uh, at least responsive to some degree that, you know, uh, we're going to be aware of it. We'll probably make an announcement uh, that something's happened. Some people probably, hopefully, you know, go by the funeral home, maybe... The women are able to prepare a meal. Uh, maybe we'll have, if it's one of our members or things, we'll have a meal for them, uh, you know, after the services. Uh, so we're kind of aware when something bad happens, at least on that magnitude. But do we go out of our way to say, has anything good happened here this week? Anything good happened at all that we can celebrate about? And we've been talking about joy all year. Uh, now he's, he's getting real carried away. Now he's looking for a reason. But the Bible says, rejoice with those who rejoice. And as Paul writes the Roman letter, there were a lot of people who were suffering. And Christians were being persecuted, and their lives were actually in instances that were being taken. And that's, you know, when we read Romans 8 verse 28, and he said, we know that in all things God works together for good of those that love Him and are called according to His purpose. We've got to remember that at that same time, uh, Nero, the Roman emperor in 60-something A.D., 66, 67 A.D., I believe, he actually tortured Christians, wrapped them in tar and other substances, and set them on fire in his garden at night. He was, they just used Christians as lanterns in his garden. And amid all that persecution, the Apostle Paul said, we know that in all things God works for the good of those that love Him. And see, that puts it in light. Now the other part of this verse says, mourn with those who mourn. And this part of Romans 12 verse 15 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice. Now the key text tonight, and I encourage you to turn there, is from Luke 15. And we'll look in this chapter of Luke 15, there are three parables. And we're only going to look tonight at the first two parables. It's uh, uh, Jesus gives this idea that if a you, if you, man has a hundred sheep and loses one, he'll go find the lost one. In the same way, if a woman has ten coins and loses one, uh, she'll search diligently and find the lost one. At the end of both of those instances, both of those parables, Jesus said they'll call their friends and neighbors and say, let's, let's have a party. Let's celebrate. What was lost has been found. And that really is rejoice with those who rejoice. It's all set the stage from Luke 15 here. Um, the Pharisees, as this, as this passage starts out, the Pharisees are muttering against Jesus because all the tax collectors and sinners are gathering around to hear him. And they hate that and they can't stand the attention he gets. Moreover, he's associating himself with these tax collectors and sinners and they really, it bothers them severely. And they're all muttering against Jesus. So he's showing a lot about God's redemptive plan and God's mercy and how God celebrates over one sinner who repents. 
And, and that's what we're looking at tonight. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Luke 15, starting at verse 1, the Bible says this. He says, Now the Pharisees and the tax... I'm sorry. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be rejoicing, there will be rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 sinners, who, than over 99 rather, who do not need to repent. Verse 8. Or suppose, or suppose, uh, suppose a woman has 10 coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors and says, Rejoice! Rejoice with me, I found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for your love and your mercy. Help us to see what brings you joy and what, what causes rejoicing in your presence among your angels around the throne. Help us to share that joy and to, to, to strive, to labor for that end that we'll seek, uh, search for those lost, those who will listen. Everybody's not going to listen. Uh, most are going to be lost. Great is... Uh, Broad is the road, wide is the gate. But the path to the straight and narrow, a few will find it. But my Father, may we search carefully for those who will listen, those who will heed. And may we rejoice over those who repent. We pray your blessings on our congregation. We pray your blessings uh, on us individually. Use us for, for your glory. We love you. We thank you for all of your patience with us. We continue to ask you for increase. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Here in Luke chapter uh, 15, we find uh, this idea, these two parables, and we're going to see this verse, I hope, several times tonight. Rejoice with those who... What does Romans 12, 15 say? Rejoice with those who rejoice. Now Jesus tells this parable, as the Pharisees are muttering against Him, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. He tells two parables. The first one is a hundred sheep. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one. There are scholars who are divided about would, would somebody with a hundred sheep actually leave 99 and go after one? And that's a whole discussion. You know, uh, some people would say, no, you, wouldn't, you would never leave 99 to go after one that's lost. But a really careful, studious, uh, good steward of a shepherd who could leave, supposing he could leave his 99 in a safe location or somebody could watch over him, then he would go after the one that's lost. So that's a whole discussion in and of itself. But as Jesus tells this parable, earthly story, heavenly meaning, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one. Loses one of them. Will he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost one? Search for it until he finds it. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me! I have found my lost sheep. Now I think what Jesus meant to say is he posted it on Facebook. But he does say uh, he calls his friends and neighbors together and I almost automatically think of a phone call. Hey man, I found my lost sheep. And we got to know and realize of course that uh, they didn't have that luxury back then. So it was word of mouth. You know, people knew the sheep was gone long enough. People knew were aware of it. 
And then when the sheep was found, they, they in the same way, forecast or broadcast that same, that same information. I found my sheep. So it, he put it on his shoulders. He's happy. He's joyful. And he goes home. Now, the part of verse 7 that's always been a concern, I guess, in a way to me as I read it, um, is the last part where Jesus talks about their, uh, their will be rejoicing in heaven. Over one sinner who repents, more rejoicing in heaven. Over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. The question is always like, well, who's righteous and doesn't need to repent? And that's nobody, you see. But Jesus in Luke 15 is talking to these Pharisees who have literally spent their entire lives following and trying to follow diligently the law of Moses. Now they haven't done that perfectly, but they've, they've tired themselves to try to do it. And if you remember the rich young ruler, we call him rich because he occurs in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, three Gospels, and he's described as being rich, young, and a ruler. So we call him the rich young ruler. He comes to Jesus and he says, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus gives him a series of commands, six of them, or six of the Ten Commandments. Uh, Honor your father and mother and don't steal and don't kill and, and that kind of thing. Jesus gives a list. And this rich young ruler said, I've done all that. I have done all that, man. Woo, I'm in. I've done all that stuff. And the Bible says Jesus looked at him and loved him. And he said, well, there's one thing else you need to do. You need to take all your possessions, everything you got, and sell it, and give all the money to the poor, and then come and follow me. And he went away sad. It was too much. It was too much to lose, to give up. You see, these Pharisees, they kept, they kept so much of the law, they, they really they counted the steps that they walked on the Sabbath day so they could keep it holy. They didn't, they didn't bear false witness. They didn't kill. They... They, they were so morally sound so much that they would say, this man welcomes sinners and eats with him. They had a lot of legalistic righteousness. They kept a lot of rules. And I believe that's what verse 7 is talking to. We know. Clearly everybody needs to repent, right? Doesn't the Bible say all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? So clearly it does not mean some of them were perfect. So that, that must be the explanation. Had too much love for money. The rich young ruler absolutely did, yeah. Yeah, Jesus didn't ask anybody else to do that. That was not a prerequisite for anybody else in the New Testament. You know, that was, that was his love, and that's, where, that's what Jesus knew, and that's what he, that's what he told him. Uh, so, in verse 7, the first part of that verse says, uh, I tell you, notice this, rejoice with those who rejoice. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven. And that gives us a glimpse. Who, who knows what's going on in the presence of God up in heaven? Jesus does. And, and he says, uh, in the same way, a man finds a sheep, he puts it on his shoulders, he joyfully calls home, he spreads a word to his friends and neighbors, rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep. In the same way, I tell you there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. You see, you get this idea of a celebration, of happiness, of joy. Psalm 100, verse 1. Woohoo! Yeah, you, you get that real life. A man finds a sheep, that's a big deal. The Bible says, just keep it in mind as we're going along. What does Romans 12, 15 say? Rejoice with those who rejoice. I think we could all use that reminder. You find somebody, even when things ain't going good for you, you can rejoice with somebody. You give, it will be given unto you. You find somebody, something good's going for. Your dad be down or everything you touch just turns to rust. Everything somebody else touched turns to gold. But you find that guy and you rejoice with him because things are going good for him. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Keep that whole picture in mind as Jesus goes on the next parable. Ten coins. Suppose a woman had ten coins and loses one. I particularly like this. A parable a whole lot. Why? Because I lose stuff. Anybody else here lose something? I mean, I don't know how many times. I mean, really, uh, and I've been blessed to hold quite a few revivals, but there have been multiple times where I get back home and they have to FedEx my Bible to me. I leave my Bible at church. But you know, a lot of times they're feeding me and stuff and they got meals and stuff going on, all kinds of activities, and that's the last thing. And I, Thankfully, I don't always have to use it when I'm up there, so that's the last thing I'm really thinking about. So, I mean, it can happen. 
But I mean, car keys, uh, <clears throat> that's my mom. Telephones, uh, jackets, uh, you know, so when my kids are looking for shoes, they can't get out the door. Where did you put them? Where'd you take them off last? I'm just saying to them what I've been asked my whole life. That's what Stephanie says to me. Where'd you take them off last? She got that from my mom. <laughs> we, we all, if you're like me, I mean, surely everybody in this room has misplaced something, right? So, uh, I like this parable for that reason, as well as some others, but uh, Jesus says, Suppose a woman has ten coins and loses one. Does she not? Light a lamp? I mean, a sheep will get up and run away, and you know, it wanders off, so you have to go after it. But a coin, it don't run away. You might fall out at the, at the store just a while ago, um, up at Davis Market just uh, an hour ago, uh, the boys were out playing. They were playing hide and seek in the Christmas trees up there. And they come up with a, Dad, look what I found. Uh, who what? One of the boys, somebody found it. They said, look what I found. It was a wedding ring. Yeah, gold, 14 carat, you know, a yellow gold wedding ring. I said, man, you just saved somebody's life. I mean, somebody's wife don't know that's gone yet. I mean, it's a big deal. Uh, everybody knows you, you lose something. Coin, a sheep will wander off, but uh, coins won't wander off. So if anybody lost a ring uh, and she don't know about it yet, go up to Davis Market, it may, may fit, you know. There you go. Uh, this lady's lost a coin, and it says, Jesus says, does she not light a lamp? That means Greg turned lights on. That's why he didn't have any lights. See, they light a lamp. Uh, they light a lamp, uh, sweep the house, as for you could do it by remote control. And they would, she would search carefully until she finds the lost coin. But notice what happens. Uh, she would call her friends and neighbors together. It sounds exactly like what happened in the first parable because it is exactly like it. The only word that changes in that sentence is that the first guy found a lost sheep and she now calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice. Rejoice with me. I found my lost coin. The same idea. Something that was lost is now found. First it was a sheet, now it's a coin. You read the last of uh, Luke 15, it's, it's a son that's lost. And Jesus is setting the stage here uh, on what is important and how merciful God really is. And you might think these are just tax collectors and sinners, but they're really children of God, you see. And you see the rejoicing that takes place. I found my sheep, I found my coin. What does Romans 12, 15 say, church? See, it's, it's something you do intentionally. You find somebody that that's something good's happened to and you go to rejoice, you do something to celebrate with them. Uh, rejoice with those who rejoice. And notice what the takeaway is in verse 10. Jesus said, in the same way, she calls her friends. I mean, it was gone long enough that people knew it was, it was gone. She's missing a coin. In the same way, when she finds it, she sweeps her house, whatever it is, she finds a coin and now she's spreading the word. Come rejoice with me, I found my lost coin. In the same way, that, that excitement. Jesus said, I tell you, there is rejoicing in that same way in the presence of God. In the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, I will call to your attention that in the first parable, Jesus said, uh, there will be rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. But this parable is different. Will be is future tense. There will be rejoicing of one sinner who repents. But in Luke 15 verse 10, Jesus said, in the same way there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. See, Jesus in the first parable said will be. Here he says there is. And this, this sermon's all about rejoicing with those who rejoice. And you find somebody, something's good happened to you, you can, you can celebrate with them. It's a job, it's a new car, it's whatever's going on in life. It's a, a child that's come home or a, a prodigal child that's returning home. Whatever's happened that you can celebrate, you find somebody and you celebrate with them. But in these stories, it's, it's more than just a coin and a sheep, you see. It's, it's about what God really, God's looking for His children to come home. And when one does come home, there's rejoicing. Jesus said in the first parable, there will be rejoicing in heaven. This parable, he says, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God. Again, who knows what's happening in the presence of the angels of God? 
Jesus does. And He's telling us what's happening. In the exact same way there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And this really opens the door for us, you see. So many times we look at situations, we say, man, what is, what exactly is God's will? And you might, hopefully, somebody here tonight would say, well, I'll tell you, preacher, one thing it is. Give thanks in all circumstances. You would say that because that's what we studied this morning. Hopefully you remember. Anybody here this morning? Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. Give thanks in all circumstances. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So hopefully you'd say that. But more, more than that, I mean, how, how do we know God's will? And, and uh, faithful saints would say, well, if you want to know God's will, you need to study your Bible about it. What, what are you going through? Uh, what are you trying to consider? What do you need to do? You, you need to study your Bible and see what the Bible says about that topic. Okay. So I read my Bible, but I still don't know A or B. A or B, neither one's wrong. I've got a decision to make. Uh, what should I do? Well, you need, you, need to, you need to pray about it. All right, that's great. I, I can pray. I'll go to my room. I'll close my door. Matthew 7, I'll get her down. Matthew 6, sir. Matthew 6, 7, Sermon on the Mount. Go into your room, close your door, and pray to your Father who's unseen. Well, I go to God and pray. I got A and B. What, sh- what should I do? And it's no, there's no right or wrong answer. I'm going to be serving the Lord if I do A. I'm going to be serving the Lord if I do B. So I still don't know, you see. So I've read the Bible. I've prayed. Well, what's God's will for me? Well, uh, you need to be a little more faithful in the church. You know, you get with Christian friends and then, you know, you'll be more prepared to make a decision. All right, okay. So I go get more Christian friends. I'm surrounded by Christian people. I'm reading my Bible. I'm praying. I've still got a decision to make. There's A and there's B. Neither one of them is wrong. What's God's will for me? What do I need to do? And you see, life comes at us that way. We know in the the Bible, uh, when Abraham sent uh, his servant to find a wife for his son Isaac, the servant prayed and he said, God, when I go, let it be that the the lady that I asked to water my uh, camels, I believe it was camels if I remember correctly, the first one I asked for help, if she says, yeah, you can water and and uh, it was about water and livestock. You can look that up in the book of Genesis. But he prayed, and that was the sign he asked for. And because he prayed, God granted the sign, and there it was, the first one he came, Isaac married Rebekah, and Rebekah came, and, and she helped and watered his, his livestock too. So uh, he knew it was a sign from God. Over in the book of Judges, there was a judge that ruled. His name was Gideon. Gideon was a great leader, had battle and so forth, great leader. But if you remember when God called him, Uh, he at one point there in his leadership, he set out a fleece. And he said, if if all the ground is dry, he done it two ways, if all the ground uh, ground is dry and the fleece is wet, I'll know it's a sign from you. It happened. Then he had asked God on a separate instance there, he said, if this is if this is wet and all the ground is dry or vice versa, whichever one I said first. It was both ways. First it would be dry, then it would be wet. Uh, It was both ways. Gideon's fleece went out. Man, if I had a decision, A or B, neither one's wrong. And I could set the fleece out. Son, I'd be buying some fleece. I'd be selling that stuff for you. But see, God chooses uh, not to operate in that way for us, you see. Uh, Praying will help. Studying the Word of God will help, absolutely. Associating with Christian people, absolutely. You, You look at the situations, you evaluate Working you can serve best, the most full capacity, and you look at what you should do, you see? When we look and see God's will, we know 1 Thessalonians 5, God's will is for you to be thankful. Give thanks in all circumstances. We know that's true. And everything else, every other decision I think we should make, A or B, neither one's wrong, what should I do? I think it should be clothed. We know for sure beyond any doubt This is what God really wants and what God wants most. This is what God wants so bad that, well, He gave His only begotten Son. This is what God wants. And this is God's will that every every decision we make should be clothed in. 1 Timothy 2, verse 3 and 4. Uh, Paul talks there about prayer. He says, this is good. It pleases God our Savior who wants all men to be saved. God's will. 
He wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. That's what the cross of Calvary is all about. God wants people to be saved. He wants people to realize His goodness, to accept His grace, to be washed in the blood of Jesus, to be heaven bound. That's what He wants. And when we realize, rejoice with those who rejoice. And you want to know how to make God rejoice? It's to help somebody obey the gospel. It's to do, it's to plan the water, do it with joy. And when we see somebody obey the gospel of Christ, don't you know? There is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And, and you see how that changes the game? Rejoice with those who rejoice. When we consider that's God. Rejoice with God when God rejoices. So we said it our priority, man. We're not going to be satisfied sitting here doing nothing, just praying and having Bible study. We're going to be telling people about Jesus, which of course involves prayer and Bible study. But we're going to be doing it with this purpose to go reach people, to go spread the good news. If we really believe, if we really truly believe that people without Christ are lost, that changes the way we do business. Because unless we reach them with the gospel, they're, they're going to eternal lake of fire. Damnation awaits them. And if we really believe what the Bible does say, then it's time for us to put things in perspective. Yeah, it's not going to be easy. People are not going to, people are not going to see where we're coming from. They'll think we're a bunch of radicals over at East Point. Man, a bunch of radical people down there trying to serve Christ, knocking on doors. I mean, they, they wild down there. If we're about God's business, we believe unless we reach them, they're going to go to hell. It's true. We believe that. We take a stand on it. We go to share the good news and we're rejoicing with God when God rejoices. And that's all that matters. It changes the game. You agree? Rejoice with those who rejoice when you consider that person who's rejoicing is God. As Jesus tells these parables in Luke 15. There will be rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents and over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. There is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, scholars are, are up in the air, I guess you could say. Some people would say, you know, from Luke 15, verse 10, there is, re there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God. That means God is there in heaven on the throne, and the angels there are rejoicing in His presence. Definitely, that's one possibility. But one other possibility you at least got to consider is that God could be the one doing the rejoicing. There's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God. It could be God's rejoicing and the angels get to witness, take part in, celebrate with Him. There's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God. In Luke 15, uh, hopefully if the Lord allows coming to a sermon near you, uh, we'll be looking at the prodigal son. And we know in that story, God is clearly uh, portrayed as the Father. When his son comes home, he runs out to meet him, throws a big party. There's rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. What does Romans 12, 15 say? And that's something, if, if I've ever preached a sermon uh, titled Rejoice with Those Who Rejoice, I don't remember. Somebody, Davy's probably got wrote in his Bible. He'll tell me about it later. But I don't remember. And I do think we could all use that, that reminder. Is hey, Find somebody that is rejoicing. Yeah, things are bad for you. Fair enough. Okay. But find somebody celebrating. Rejoice with those people. Because you give, and it will be given to you. And that's the way, in God's economy, that's the way it works. Tonight, um, you're here and you have a decision to follow Christ. It involves faith and obedience. You hear the Word of God. That's the first step. Romans 10, verse 17 says, Faith comes by hearing the Word. The Word of God. You believe what you heard? Uh, then it's faith without works is dead, so you have to put your faith in action. Like James says in James chapter 2. And what that means is you decide that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You make that confession known with your mouth, and you decide you're going to follow Him, which is a change of your heart, it's repentance. And at that moment, you're ready. You're ready to do what the Scripture says you have to do. Unless you're born of the water and of the Spirit, you will not enter into the kingdom of God. And Jesus said that in John 3 verse 5. 
So at that moment, believing, repenting, confessing, you're ready to, to bury the old man. A watery grave of baptism, four, the forgiveness of sins, two, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You start on your new life. Buried with Christ, raised to walk in new life. If you have a decision tonight, we're ready to throw a party rejoicing with God which is where the angels are rejoicing over one sinner who repents. If you're here tonight and you've never obeyed the gospel, you have a decision to rededicate your life, any decision, as we all...